Thanks everybody for coming this morning. Uh, thanks PNCA, this place is pretty awesome. So hopefully you guys get to go around and check all the amazing art out. And thanks for CLE for hosting this morning and putting it together, not just this morning, but every single month throughout the year, which is pretty amazing that you do that. <laughs> so what I want to talk about today is a myth. And it's a myth that I find pervasive in my life. Whether it was one when I was a kid, or whether it was one when I was much older, not that I'm that old, uh, and sort of carries on throughout my career, and it's the myth of the creative hero. And what I want to try to do today is debunk that myth by using the theme of humility. But not humility as this concrete, hyper-tangible destination at which we're expected to arrive to, but humility as a practice. And a practice that has beliefs that each one of us can implement in our days in our personal lives, and our professional lives, to do something very specific. And the reason I want to talk about the myth of the creative hero is I feel like it is this incredible obstacle to achieving something really simple that all of us want in our lives, happiness. In my own life, the creative hero has been almost like this inner demon in some ways. Each time that I get an opportunity to go do something, whether it's today, right here at Creative Mornings, whether it's starting Context Partners, whether it's even just, in some regards, being with my family, there's always this choice I have to make. And the choice I have to make is about, is this about me? And is the expectation of me to be a hero in this situation, swooping in to solve all the problems, to be, in some regards, what society expects of us as creatives, or is my job to do something different? And I think my job is to do something different, and that's what I try to achieve with each step of my life. It's really hard. So today what I want to do is talk about a little bit about how I prepared for today to come to this conclusion. And then I want to walk through a sort of a three-part story. And it's three parts of my own life with three interactions where I had to confront this inner demon, the myth of the creative hero. So when I started to prepare for today, I did something that I, I normally do, whether it's at work or whether it's you know, preparing for something like this. And I got a bunch of friends together, and we sat down, and we talked about humility. And so I'm all excited. I'm like, this would be really cool. It's this phrase and this value in society that we all espouse to and hold in really high regard. So I'm like, everybody's going to want to talk about this. And so we sit down, and one of my friends, right out the gate, as I asked the question of, what do you think about humility? His answer was, I don't think I'd give a shit. <laughs> and I was like, oh, this is not a very good start to this. Hopefully this isn't how 100 people are going to feel on a Friday morning. And I was like, OK, let's go a little bit more. Why don't you give a shit? And his point was, he was like, I don't think it's relevant. He's like, why is this relevant in my life? Why, why do I have to care about being humble or humility? And so we, we started this discussion about it. And what we found is we didn't actually share the same definition of what humility even meant, which then was this kind of striking moment for me in preparing for this, which was like, maybe I don't actually know what humility means. It's, it's like problem. So we did what we do in current days. We pulled out our phones and we looked up humility. <laughs> <laughs> see, see, see if we all got the same term. Which, which we did, and we were really sad to find the definition, which the definition was a modest or low view of one's own importance. And we kind of read that and we thought, so basically it's to feel lowly about yourself and contributions in the world. And we quickly found that's, that's not what we were talking about. While we may not have had the six or seven words that we all agreed, yes, that's the definition, we certainly agree that that's not what we felt humility was about. So we got in more of a conversation and we started to talk about, well, what is humility? And what's it actually mean for us and why is it relevant? And the conclusion that we came to was that it's incredibly important for kind of that one simple reason I mentioned a few minutes ago. 
And it's this reason that probably shows up in your Facebook feed in some like faux scientific article that we all read and then pass around that tells us about connections, relationships and community all being the gateway to happiness and success. It's pretty true. It's kind of hard to say, no, you know, relationships aren't that important and being part of a community does not equal happiness or success. Doesn't matter. It's like, no, it's pretty straightforward. You just kind of get it. Like, absolutely, that's what it's about. But it, those faux scientific posts on your Facebook page don't tell you how to get it. So like, great, so should I just go join a community? Like, what do I do? And what we found is that humility is the pathway towards finding that happiness. It's the pathway towards building relationships, towards finding community. And as we came to that conclusion, we all started to give these anecdotes in our lives about how we had been challenged or something had come up, whether it was self-made or in the environment that we've created for ourselves that keeps us from practicing humility. And over and over, what we found is it's this incredible myth that I believe society has perpetuated and each one of us in many regards has adopted, which is that our job as a creative is to be the hero. When we stand in front of a client or a boss, a buyer, somebody who's looking at our art, we're supposed to stand up there very proudly, take all the credit, claim how amazing and brilliant we are for creating this piece, and carry the weight of that on our backs. But I think that's bullshit. I don't think that's how it works. I don't think that's how we actually attain success. And I certainly don't think that's what actually delivers creativity, which is what is expected of all of us as creatives. So then I started to go down my own path. And my own path began in a lot of places where all of our paths begin as children. And if your path didn't begin as a child, I would be very interested to talk to you after today because it's probably a super interesting story. Um, so as a kid, I grew up in a small town in West Virginia, about 20,000 people, coal mining legacy, little lightweight manufacturing, not necessarily the hub of creativity in America, at least sort of from the outside looking in. And both my parents were working parents. And for any of you who had working parents or are working parents yourself, you know that there is this constant dilemma you have to deal with, which is what to do with your kids. You gotta go to work. And in my case, my parents were both entrepreneurs. My dad a business entrepreneur, my mom a social entrepreneur. And so for them, it's not that they just worked nine to five, my parents worked nine to nine, basically seven days a week. They were dedicated and passionate about what they did, uh, almost to a point of confusion for a child. And so when they had to think about what they were gonna do with their kids, both of us, myself and my sister, they had two options. One is send us to our family members, which wasn't a bad option. My family lived on a river in West Virginia. It was beautiful. You could go out and swim and play. They were nice people. But as a kid, you always wanna be with your parents. It's your mom and dad. So I chose option number two more often than not, which was to go to work with my parents. And as I went in to go to work with my parents, I'm in business meetings, I'm watching them plan events, I'm watching them deal with what it takes to run a business or an organization. Every day started with the exact same phrase. My dad would sit me down and he'd sort of stare at me and he'd say, your job today is to be seen and not heard. <laughs> and so I sort of took that as a little kid as this like stone cold truth. I would go and sit in the corner of the room and literally sit there silently like staring at my knees, saying to myself like, don't talk, don't talk, don't talk, be quiet. And over a number of years, I, I had dialed that in and I was actually pretty good at being quiet and not getting in trouble. Um, and then I started to watch what was going on in the room. I started to watch business deals being made. I started to watch the management of organizations and businesses. I started to watch how you deal with big decisions. And inevitably, there was always this person in the room the person I came to personify as the hero of that, what now I know is called a meeting, but at that time seemed something a little cooler or had a better name to it. Um, and that person was the one who came in the room and they came and they brought this energy. And they sort of took that almost Superman pose and when they talked, it came out with this incredible volume and their body exuded this energy and everybody stopped and listened, everybody. 
and their body orientation was sort of blown back, almost like the energy and volume from that voice was sort of pushing them almost out of their chairs. And I always watched them and thought, that's the person that knows what's going on. In my 1980s childhood ideals, it was like the business Rambo coming into a meeting and able to just be like, here's where we're gonna go, like it was a wartime scenario even though they may have just been deciding what to serve for breakfast out of Creative Mornings. Um, and I thought, that person is what you're supposed to be. That's what the ideal of a great business person is. That's the hero of the room. But then as I got a little older and started to watch even more and more, I realized that something else was happening. That person left the room, and all the other people's body language went from being blown back to easing and turning into each other. And as they turned into each other, they didn't immediately start talking, they started asking questions. How are you doing? What do you think? How do you feel about that decision that was just made? What should we do next? And eventually as they started to talk, I realized they were doing something so simple, they were building relationships. They were listening to each other. They were doing something that in modern day society we like to call practicing empathy. But I think it was just so simple, they were just caring about each other. And that's when I realized that's where the actual decisions were being made. This person who was loud and bombastic was actually the distraction. They weren't the hero. They seemed like it, but they were the person that they were actually waiting to leave the room. They, in some regards, were being quiet so that person would make their decision, get out, and then the real work could begin. And I think it's a person that we all see in our lives. We've experienced them, and at times, we probably are that person. But I would argue that person isn't very effective, but it's exactly what we promote as the hero, as the creative. And as we have to go in and a lot of times sell the work we do, well, what are we expected to often do? Get up there. Be charismatic. Be direct. Tell the world where to go. But then we leave the room, and the real work gets done. So what I found is, as leaders, our job is not to be the hero, our job is to listen. So that first principle or that belief that I came to was one my parents taught me really early, to be seen and not heard, the art of listening. So after 18 years of being seen and not heard, you can imagine there was a lot of like pent up need to be heard and talk and be kind of loud. Uh, so I probably spent from 18 to like 25 being an obnoxious ass um, <laughs> and making a lot of mistakes that were certainly not in the practice of humility and probably not what one would describe as humble. Um, but through that I learned a lot. And I learned a lot about how to practice listening, when it was helpful, when it wasn't. It, and I came to this other conclusion, which is I was really interested now in understanding not just how work gets done, but I wanted to understand how ideas are formed. I wanted to go and understand from the most brilliant idea people, the entrepreneurs, the creatives that are out there fundamentally changing the world. And so I got to the pretty unique opportunity to go work with an organization that focuses on social entrepreneurs and social innovators around the world. And I didn't just get to go work with two or three, I got to work with literally thousands in over 50 countries. I got to spend time in New York City high-rises, watching ideas like crowdsourcing emerge. I got to spend time on the jungle floor of India, watching the conservation movement rise up. And each time I did, I was looking for the aha moment. This illustrious, brilliant time when the idea came out of a single person's mind and fundamentally changed the way we interact in life. And in a lot of times as I was out there traveling, seeing these entrepreneurs, spending time with them, what I saw were these very strong visual and visceral situations they were involved in. They were trying to save natural resources that were just being ripped out of the earth right in front of you. They were running into brothels and saving small children who had been pulled into sex trafficking. They were dealing in situations where there were no hospitals and there were kids dying of diseases that we would have solved here pretty easily. And always at the forefront of that was this entrepreneur who was right out in front driving the charge. 
And what were we doing to that entrepreneur is we were putting them up on this pedestal as the hero of the day that was going to solve these problems and all of our problems. But after I got over the visual harshness, the sort of immediacy of seeing these problems and just how shocking it was to have a system that is so broken and someone so brave to be tackling it, I got to another layer, just like I did when I was watching those meetings that I got to sit in on with my parents. And what I found is that there is no aha moment. It doesn't exist. It is complete myth. The entrepreneur as the hero who sits out there and has this stroke of brilliance that's fundamentally going to solve all of our ills, it's not true. Instead, what I saw is these entrepreneurs were building communities. And as they were building communities, they were weaving together insights and ideas that were all around them. And what they were able to do was be an outlet or channel for those ideas and to be an organizer of those communities. That was an incredible role. But that's a very different role than what we anticipated and almost sold them as in society and then expected them to be. Which is something that I think a lot of times as creatives, people expect of us. Which is to be able to sit in a room, be given a problem, and turn on a dime to give you the most brilliant solution you have ever heard in your life. <laughs> How unrealistic is that? And to think you're going to build a career on that? That means like, what, 10 times a day? You got to just be like popping out all these brilliant ideas. Unrealistic. And oftentimes when we put the person up and say, ah, that's what that person does, we're perpetuating a myth that we all then have to deal with and live up to and fight against in our day-to-day -day lives. And it's unreal. It's not true. And when I realized it really wasn't true was when I read Stephen Johnson's book, Where Good Ideas Come From. And what Stephen Johnson did was pretty awesome. He took these great world-changing ideas, and instead of looking at how they impacted the world, he took that idea and took it all the way backwards to say, how did it actually get created? He wanted to test the same assumption. Is there the stroke of brilliance? Are the best ideas created by someone who isolates themselves in a room with a whiteboard, maybe, with some post-it notes, maybe, with their pad and paper? And what he found is, is just not true. And he found the inverse, which is that there's this concept he created called the fourth quadrant. And inside the fourth quadrant, it's where all good ideas come from. And the fourth quadrant is fundamentally built upon connections. Cities create fourth quadrants because we get access to bouncing ideas and inspiration off of each other. Salons, the classic idea of bringing great minds together, was really about forming these strokes of brilliance and ideas. It was about sharing what we would now call crowdsourcing. Those are the fourth quadrant. Those are where brilliance come from. Not a sole individual on their own somehow out of nowhere having the light bulb go off in brilliance. Not how it works. So I found that so much of what I've been trying to do myself, which is show up in these meetings or rooms or situations around the world and try to solve the problem on my own, was not just wrong and ineffective, it was actually polarizing. And if we look at what science now tells us about entrepreneurs and incredible creatives, it's a lonely job. That leads to isolation, depression, lack of community, unclear sense of self. It's like, how are all these negative attributes really damaging ones associated with someone that in media we put up as the brilliant happy hero? It just doesn't connect. So as I got to see this first belief of being seen and not heard, and the second one that there is no aha moment, I then wanted to go and understand, so where do the best solutions actually come from? And since I didn't believe it was just the single person, the sole entrepreneur, I wanted to really go and find, well, how are these communities being built? How are they actually created? What are the structures behind them that equal brilliance? And so I started Context Partners to do that. And it's what we get to do every day. It's a pretty amazing job that we have. And inside of that, what we quickly found in helping build communities was that the people who have 
the best answers are those who are closest to the problem. It's a super simple insight. Those who are dealing with a situation every single day have most of the information. They have by far the greatest stake in actually finding a good solution. And in many ways, they're the most passionate about it. But if we think about how we say design products, or how we do brand development, or how we create strategies, a lot of times we don't really engage those people. We may do an interview, we may pop out a survey, but at the end of the day, it's often a few people isolated in front of a whiteboard in an office trying to come up with that, once again, stroke of brilliance herself, to go and tell those people what they should care about, what the solution is. And then when it doesn't get adopted, whether it's even internally with a group of employees, we're shocked. We're like, well, how could they not love this? Did they not see how hard I worked with my team coming up with this awesome creative solution? When the reality is they're like, who are you? I've never even met you coming to tell me what my life's about, what I should care about. So we flipped that on its head to really put into practice this belief that those closest to the problem have the solutions. In one of our early examples, and it was actually the first project that we ever did at Context Partners, was all about the Affordable Care Act, what may be better known as Obamacare now. Probably a great personification of, once again, putting someone up as a hero that's completely unrealistic. Like the guy sat there in his office, the, yeah. like writing, <laughs> writing out Obamacare. It's like, I'm gonna get it this time. Um, <laughs> unrealistic, that's not how it happened. Uh, and so we took this Affordable Care Act, and whether you love it or hate it, you know, for us, that, that wasn't the point. The point was it was a law, and it was one that was supposed to be implemented. And 50 states now had this challenge to say, I have no idea what to do, because it was written way up here, and we live down here where actual we live, citizens live. And so we had an organization that had focused on health policy called uh, NASHB, for short, and the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation come and say, how do we solve this? How do we actually get this thing implemented? And so what we did is something really simple. We just created a framework in an online community, not for the people who were perceived to be the decision makers, a lot of times political appointees, a lot of times people who were only in the healthcare system for a year, two years, maybe four years, but the people who had dedicated their lives to it. These were the people that when you had to look at something like the Affordable Care Act's role, or questions around low-income dental programs in urban communities, pretty specific, it turns out there is someone that has been isolated away inside of a government building, sitting in a cubicle that's probably in a room with no windows, that's probably surrounded by another room with no windows, passionately trying to solve that problem. No one knows who they are. And I guarantee you, no one asked that person how to write that legislation. And so we just created a simple construct that allowed them to come and solve that problem and allow the world to see it. And what we saw is people coming and passionately telling us, oh my God, finally, someone's asking me what I think. People crying, raging, rolling tears, saying, this is what I've spent my whole career dedicated to, and now I have the opportunity to actually have my voice heard. And we're thinking, such a simple step. All we had to do was just create the pathway for them to have their voice heard in a way that's actually going to influence their own work in the way the world works. Pretty straightforward. We just took that belief that those closest to the problem have the solutions and we put it into action. We made it real. What we actually did is we went and empowered their ability to be leaders instead of trying to be the leaders for them. And what so many times we find is that clients come to us and what they expect to have happen is that we're going to come up with a solution. But we've sort of reframed this creative hero situation to say that it's not our job to come and tell you what should happen, it's our job to be a facilitator. Our job is to have the frameworks, the tools, the resources that allow those voices, those ideas and those solutions that sit on the ground to be manifested in a way that they could have never done on their own. We connect them as that community to give them experiences that only the community can give them. And by doing that, we debunk this myth that the creative hero should come in and solve it. And so those are these three beliefs that when we had to reflect back, 
myself and my friends on why is humi humility relevant, that we kept finding this is what makes it relevant. Because when we do things like being seen and not heard, we find ourselves connecting with people in ways that we can't when we keep talking. When we realize there is no aha moment, we stop trying to perpetuate the myth that we're going to solve some problem on our own and that we will be rewarded for doing so. And we get all the reward. And we actually start to engage those closest to the problem to solve them because we realize they actually have the solutions and we don't. And even if we have great answers, they're not theirs and they're not going to take them. They're not going to own them. Essentially, we broke it down to three really simple things. Listening, collaborating, and empower. And I think my invitation or challenge to us today is to take those three words, to take those three simple beliefs, and take the rest of our Friday, one day in our lives, of which most of us are going to go out and be expected to be, or interact with, or create the environment for the creative hero. And instead of doing that, Let's go out and actively listen. Right as we think we're going to say something, let's take a step back and say, I'm going to ask a question. I'm going to let somebody else talk. And then instead of trying to immediately come up with the answer, let's see if we can't actually collaborate with others and form an idea by colliding with inspiration, colliding with other people's insights. And then let's go and empower someone else to go find that solution or be the solution developer. Let's let them be the creative. Let's change the way that we think about the creative hero all throughout our day. And my estimation or hypothesis will be that we're going to be happier at the end of today. We're going to feel more connected to the people who we interact with throughout our life. We're going to feel like we have healthier relationships. We're going to feel like we're part of a community. We're going to take that post that shows up on your Facebook feed, and we're not just going to let it be something that we continually share or comment on or like, we're actually going to live it. And we're going to live it in a real way that's about how we become successful as creatives. Thank you. So we have a few minutes for Q&A. Um, I would also just love to also invite other people to talk about maybe their experiences on this pathway to humility and anything else that resonated with you. Certainly, I'm happy to answer questions too, but you know, I don't know that I'm necessarily an expert on this. So first question. Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Um, I find, so our work is incredibly subjective. It's, it's, it's almost all what we might perceive as qualitative. And a lot of times what we're able to leverage is the fact that it's not necessarily our decision or our point of view alone. And so when we're insisting something, we're often insisting because it was the voice of the community. And in this case, it may not be you alone. It may be that what you're actually insisting is, this is the way that the best practices are done. This is the way that lots of people have considered to be the approach accepted. But I think the flip of it is also to ask them, why are you making me insist so much? And that's something that we often find pretty, pretty powerful is people then realize, like, oh, I don't actually know why I'm continuing to pound you with this question about whether it should be one inch or two inches. But, um, <laughs> So that, that's for us the key piece is like how do you actually let the community's voice or someone else's voice rather than your own be what you're able to represent? And then how do you turn the tables on them and say like, why are you making me do this? So something else you can do that's really, this is kind of easy, is you can gather consensus and then you can test your idea. So while you're building it, if you're planning how you're going to test it, 
um, and, and you're gathering consensus, then you can point to those stories to other people who are smarter than you are, right? I love that answer. That's an awesome one. I don't, know, I don't know if everybody heard it, but the point was go and develop consensus before you ever get asked the question. So that way the person who is or may believe they're smarter than you now isn't just dealing with you, but they're dealing with probably all of their peers at the same time. Another question or experience that you've had with humility? Uh, your, the word listen was, um, it really struck me pretty, pretty well because I think one thing that I had a challenge with for a long time was actually listening and during listening instead just thinking about other things while the person is talking. And I think that's one of the biggest challenges. <laughs> this person's saying stuff and I'm thinking about my grocery list, but really I should be listening to the words that are coming out of their mouth. And then when they're done, perhaps there's a little bit of space in that time to think and then respond. Yeah. Yeah, so, so, the, so the question or the comment was really about like the experience of listening and how often we may find ourselves in a situation where we're, we're actually not listening. We're just thinking about other things such as the grocery list or what I sometimes find myself doing is I'm listening, but what I'm actually doing is framing my rebuttal. Yeah. <laughs> I'm actually like, no, 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 I'm totally going to get you back. Like, I got this. <laughs> when that's not listening at all. That's basically like being in a, in a fight. Like, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to win this thing when, it's, when I don't think listening is about winning. And I, I find I do that even with my kids who are two and four. I'm like, okay, what do you got? What do you, what do you, you're going to tell, tell me about what you don't want for dinner. It's like, let me tell you what you do want for dinner. Um, and no wonder they don't end up eating it. Uh, so I, I, for me, it's also the idea that y you, you've got to be listening, not just zoning out, but actually not framing your rebuttal too, not turning it into a competition. Um, on the same lines as, as listening, one of my challenges is to not just fill up airtime. If people get very uncomfortable after 10 seconds of silence and it's not my job to finish their thought or whatever it is, is to like let that be uncomfortable and let the other person finish what they were saying. Or Yeah, so that's one thing that I've come to learn and yeah. embrace. I think it's a great point, but being comfortable with silence. Um, there's this uh, really... I don't recommend a book called, uh, I think it's called like, Who Stole My Cheese or something like that? Who Moved My Cheese, Moved My Cheese, and it's like this sales, this corporate sales book. Um, I was forced to listen to it on an eight hour drive during my first job out of uh, college between rural Virginia where I lived in New York. It was like one of the worst moments of my life. Um, <laughs> but the, in, the one thing I did take out of listening to that audio book was uh, the power of silence. And their point of view is, it's okay to have silence and just how uncomfortable we are with it. And that out of that silence, it's when people are thinking. They're figuring out, but we just want to fill it. So I think it's a great point. Um, more of an observation than a question. Uh, one of the things I really enjoy uh, in the time I worked in marketing agencies was uh, giving away credit. And the inter interesting thing about it, because good ideas come from everywhere. You know, you go talk to lots of people, and in the end, we have a great project, we have great success. And it was always one of my favorite parts was to say, and so-and-so came up with this, and so-and-so came up with that. And I don't mean just on the creative team. You know? And the funny thing is, um, giving credit actually adds to your authority. That's what I mean. So the idea is giving credit adds to your authority. I, I completely agree. It, and at the same time, what we see a lot of, and I, I even find myself challenged in this, is people's expectations that they want you to have it. They want you to be the authority, and even as of yesterday, we had a client call us who wants us to do a piece of work that our team is by far the best group to do, but they wanted me to go do the work, which for them is a false assumption because they're assuming that I'm actually the best person to do it. When my, my point of view is like, I actually am not the best person to do this. You should take these two people who are way better than I am, but they've created this false construct that I'm going to come in and make this killer, amazing situation, which honestly, I'm probably not. So I, I, I find like giving credit away is exactly what it's about. And then you still have to tackle those moments when people are going to push you to do the exact opposite. I've had the experience of that happening and then the person, there is a, there is a personality, especially in the business culture, that wants that and then they steamroll everybody in your first example. Mm -hmm. And so what I run into all the time is taking, working with that personality and kind of like secret agent 
Like, because that person really just wants to be successful. Mm -hmm. Because there's, you know, our business culture is competitive, and what we've defined as success is different in all of our minds. So, like, I take a secret agent uh, perspective and really just try to help make that person successful, but it can be a tenuous situation. And then I have another question on what happened to the online forum yeah. for, the, for the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Um, so the, the first point, just to make sure everybody heard it, is sometimes it's cool to be a secret agent. And that person who's trying to steamroll, it's probably always cool to be a secret agent in some ways, but uh, as you're experiencing the one who comes into the room, and it's what I saw happen with my parents all the time, there's the person who came in and wanted to steamroll the situation. That person really has, and many times, the same objective you do, which is they just want to be successful. And that's just the pathway they know how to do it. It's almost this blunt instrument that they don't have access to other tools. So how do you be the secret agent and actually backdoor it and help them be successful and either help mobilize around them or provide them other outlets and experiences. And then the question was about the healthcare forum, the online forum that we created. Uh, it turned out to be super successful. Um, and what was interesting in that time period, it was when you had states suing Obama and saying like, we're not gonna implement the Affordable Care Act. And then you would go on that forum and they would be implementing the Affordable Care Act. <laughs> and you're like, wait a second, what's going on here? Is this is just news hype. Like, yeah, maybe they're suing, but they're implementing it as well because what they found were there was all these good elements of it. And maybe they didn't take it wholesale. They weren't like acting on 100% of the Affordable Care Act, but they were taking the pieces that they were going to do anyways. So what, what we found is that it, it actually became a pretty vibrant community of healthcare workers. It also became a vibrant community of media, policymakers, and influencers who sat around it that looked to that group as their experts when they had traditionally looked to the perceived decision maker, which was often the political appointee. So we sort of flipped that whole paradigm. It was pretty awesome. It was fun. Uh, there was a question all the way in the back. To what, ex <coughs> excuse me, to what extent um, do you use failure as a tool? Um, because sometimes getting groups to work together, using, allowing them to fail instead of fixing something for them, can be really powerful. I'm yeah. wondering if you've ever had that moment where you, you know what the fix is and you just let it crash. Yeah. Uh, that's a really good question. So the question is, uh, how do you deal with failure? And in particular, when you've got a group or community that's coming together and, and you actually can see where it's going and you're kind of like, oh, I know what the answer is, but you actually let the community or that group come together and fail as a lesson to learn. Um, for us, failure is critical. And once again, the hero never fails, right? I mean, does like Superman ever lose? Maybe like what, twice or something? But then he came back and won again. Um, so it's like the, the sense is you never really lose. The hero's almost invincible. But the reality is, is failure is pervasive and failure is where we learn the most. And, and I think what's great as we've started to look at more brain research and we started to look at more science about social sciences, we're starting to find that all this stuff is, is proven true. I think where it used to be like a debate, now it's like, no, this is true, failure's awesome, really good stuff. <laughs> and, what we find in <laughs> and what we find in our situation is we actually see, we, we have a good sense where we can start to see where situations are going, partly because we have access to a lot of information about communities in our job, we get to, get to see a lot of the pieces, we get to, to weave together those insights. Um, and there are definitely times where you can see the group is headed towards the wrong solution, or they're just headed towards a, a breakdown or failure, which is often more about relationships than it is about the solution. And we let that happen when it's a safe space for that to happen. So when we feel like we're able to create a place where failure is not going to fundamentally damage the outcome, failure is not going to lead to people being devastated, not just fail and I learn, but like fail and I am now like persecuted for it, it's an awesome experience. And we're able to do that the majority of the time, but the times that we can't and we see it sort of running towards the cliff and it's gonna be deadly, we do jump in and stop it. But what we, what we try to do is then paint the picture where we're able to show people, this is what was about to happen and let us show you why and play the scenario out and let you choose whether or not you want to go over that cliff or what, whether you wanna take the direction that we're potentially able to steer you. So it's still their decision but we do kind of jump in and show them what the alternatives are because the other side of it just seems too risky. Um, 
question. Yeah. I have a two-pronged question. Two -part. When you were given the assignment to do this presentation, was humility in your 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 lexicon? Did you understand it as a theme of your work and your your behaviors? That's the first question. Secondly, I remember you saying what you you know it's up on the slide, the, the screen, that what you saw humility being defined as mm -hmm. from your phones. How do you, I don't remember you saying particularly what words are yours for that definition. Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, we talked about that as we created this. So going back to your first question, was humility part of my lexicon or vocabulary before I met Seely? Um, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> see, we, we can place the blame like really clearly or find, find that point of intervention. Um, and then the second one was what, what words do we use to describe it? Uh, so, I mean, it's certainly a word that we talked about and I talk about. I mean, I feel like everybody talks about humility and humbleness and is that person humble or not humble, but, but I don't know that I really knew what it meant. I don't know that I had stopped to define it in, and something that we talk about in our own work is this idea that linguists um, know but we often don't talk about the idea that we don't really know what most of the words we're saying actually mean and we don't actually know whether the other person is actually thinking the same thing that we're thinking. And there's tons of buzzwords out there like innovation. <laughs> like what the hell does innovation actually mean? <laughs> I mean, like we, we've, we have a definition in our work, but when you're in a conversation and somebody's like, oh, that was super innovative, you just let it slide. <laughs> Instead of being like, let's stop for a second. What exactly did you mean by innovative? <laughs> like we would never get anywhere in a conversation being an exhausting life. So I think, I think humility was kind of like that um, in our life at Context Partners we're really serious about our values. And I think when you add up a lot of our values, which include things like service, like we believe in service leadership, we're all about serving others, not ourselves, openness, wonder. Like those are, those are some of our values that I think you could attach to humility. And so when I think about the words that we started to use, very contextual for our environment, we trace them back to those. That being and practicing humility is about being in service to others that it is about opening up this sense of wonder, exploring what's possible, even sort of beyond what we see as curiosity. So maybe a couple more questions or, or one or two more thoughts, and then we're gonna let you guys go to your uh, day and maybe we'll practice some of what we talked about today. So right here. I think as creatives, we've all been in that situation with too many cooks in the kitchen, yeah. and by trying to please everyone, you please no one. Is, has there been a situation you've been in where everyone's been on a completely different page and something that you've used that's been able to get everyone together to actually make a decision? Mm -hmm. Yeah, good, good question. So that situation where as a creative, there's too many cooks in the kitchen, everybody's trying to please everybody or themselves, which obviously polar opposites, and what can you do to diffuse that? Um, I could probably look at my calendar and identify at least one time where that's gonna happen after this morning. <laughs> so, it happens pretty regularly, um, and even despite best efforts. It, for us, we try to do two things. So we, we talk a lot about the culture of our company, and we talk a lot about what relationships mean in our company. And we have a, a simple saying that defines the culture and relationships, which is um, priorities and performance over personalities. And what we find is that so many times when it's, you've got too many cooks in the kitchen and people are all over the place, it's one part that it's personalities. It's like personalities expressing themselves. And, and I think a lot of times what we see is it's people trying to express what they believe is supposed to happen in that meeting. The way they're supposed to behave as this like powerful leader. They're being the creative hero. And we just strip that away. And, and we even do a lot of efforts and work so that people understand what their personalities are. So when they're coming into the meeting, we can sort of call it subtly and nicely, and they're like, oh yeah, I'm doing that thing. They're like, yes, you're doing that thing again. Um, or you might catch yourself doing it. Now that's not realistic in every environment. So the flip of it is we just ask one really simple question, which is, what are we all trying to do here? And the other thing that we find is when there's too many cooks in the kitchen, it's often because they're trying to make 10 different meals. And they've forgotten that there's actually a plan. It's like, this is what we're serving. Here's the ingredients, this is the recipe. Why do you keep pulling that stuff out of your bag that you brought from home? <laughs> and trying to like put it into this like stew. It's like, please put it back it's next week. Um, so just reorienting to people to like, why are we all here? 
simple question like why are we here, what are we trying to achieve? It, in that basic piece and then trying to cut the personalities out makes a big difference. So we'll do one last uh, right up here and then we'll, we'll all head out. You were talking about uh, the people who, who drive the solution are the people who are closest to it. And you gave the example of a person who's dedicated their life to a certain problem, mm -hmm. who's in a windowless cubicle inside a windowless room inside a windowless building. It's kind of sad. How do you, how do you <laughs> create an avenue or communicate? How do you find that person? Yeah. How do you create an avenue to communicate with that person? Yeah. Or are you, are you wading through like a whole bunch of crap just to get to that gym? So the question was, um, when you talk about trying to find the person closest to the problem, that that person who I described as sort of in that cube in a windowless room in a windowless box. And it was a despairing picture I painted. Um, and I'm sure, I'm sure not all of them are in cubes and windowless areas. Um, but how do you find them and do you have to wade through just like a ton of crap to get there? And the reality is, is at times, yes, you have to wade through a ton of crap to get there. There's just like so many obstacles and things that have put in place almost for you not to find that person. It's crazy. We, we're not very good at creating environments that allow that person to be easily found, let alone empowered to go do something. In fact, we almost create the opposite environments. We create rule structured environments that are very binary, when what we believe is the best environments are principle based. They're ones where people actually get to use judgment. And when they get to use judgment, often people become more visible to us and we can find them much more easily. Um, another answer to look at that is when we're trying to find people and in our work, it's all about exploration. And so we see ourselves as explorers of communities. And so in that situation, and a lot of times, it, and you guys may find this in some of your work, people are gonna be like, well, how many interviews are you gonna do? 10, 20? And it's like, ultimately, you probably have to give them an answer and you're like, 20. Fine, whatever, 20. But the reality is, is we're going to go until we find a moment of saturation. We're going to keep going and going and going until everybody keeps saying, you know who you need to go talk to? You need to go talk to this person over here. And that simple method of constantly asking the question, which means you got to know what, what's the right question to ask, and then they keep leading you to the next person, and then you keep going to the person after that and after that, and then finally when everybody seems to be saying that same person, you feel like you've gotten somewhere. And that can be wading through a lot of crap. And it takes a lot of patience and persistence. But then once you find it, you're like, ah. And once you found it, you did something else. You actually created like the uh, value chain or like the supply chain of how information's flowing. And you get to figure out who are all the barriers to finding that person in the first place. You find all the obstacles in place. And then for us, we get to do something really cool, which is we get to redesign the environment. And we get to kind of flip it on its head and say, let's do something totally different. Let's change the sequence of how these events work. And let's take that person that I had to talk to 20 people or plus to get to and now make it that I get to talk to them directly. So I, I know everybody has busy days. I really appreciate you coming today to listen to me talk about uh, my personal experience and beliefs around humility. Hopefully it's something that you'll get to go practice in your day of listening, collaborating, and empowering. And hopefully you'll keep coming back each month to Creative Mornings and supporting what is a pretty awesome institution and value for this community. So thanks. <laughs>